Buonasera a tutti, solo alcuni saluti insomma, in italiano prima di, eh, di passare eh, all'inglese. Piacere eh, essere qui questa sera a discutere eh, dell'attualità del monetarismo. Con questa eh, espressione noi eh, ci riferiamo insomma, in modo non sempre appropriato e non sempre eh, preciso a una serie di eh, idee eh, attorno alla gestione della politica monetaria e al ruolo eh, delle banche centrali che sono tipicamente associate con la figura di Milton Friedman e anche con una serie di riforme che eh, nei paesi eh, occidentali in vario eh, grado e in modo diverso hanno preso piede sostanzialmente nella prima eh, metà degli anni eh, 80. Eh, è eh, anche un piacere perché facciamo eh, questa eh, iniziativa, siamo qui oggi a discutere assieme agli amici di un importante eh, think tank inglese che è eh, il Uh, centro per uh, l'International Center for Monetary Economics, uh, for Monetary Research, l'Institute of International Monetary Research uh, dell'Università di Buckingham e uh, per questa ragione uh, passiamo all'inglese. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's a great pleasure for Istituto Bruno Leoni to host uh, this meeting on uh, what is monetarism good for? I mean, is, is monetarism Uh, passé, I mean, is, is it a set of ideas and principle on central banking, uh, which were useful, you know, in the 1980s, but no more? Uh, that is really the question we, we're going to be uh, asking ourselves. Uh, this is a joint webinar we organized with the Institute of International Monetary Research, and we have the director of that institute and a senior lecturer in economics at the University of Buckingham, Juan Castaneda, Uh, with us. We're very happy that one is with us and uh, we will open up uh, the discussion tonight. Uh, but we do also have two very good friends uh, of our institute, uh, Antonio Foglia, who's a board member uh, of Istituto Bruno Leone, a banker and a very sharp economist. Uh, and he will play a little bit the uh, devil's advocate uh, role uh, tonight. And Jeffrey Wood, who is Emeritus Professor at the CAS Business School and is an authority on central banking and particularly the history uh, of central banking. And of course, the many failure in the history of central banking in, in the past and some success uh, too, to be fair. Um, this occasion tonight is, is peculiar and important uh, both for us and for the uh, Institute of International Monetary Research for two reasons. Um, IIMR is actually launching uh, an online course on, on this uh, topic, on this very topic, and one will uh, perhaps give us some, some reference about that, and, and of course I, I hope Uh, uh, somehow that uh, attendees and participants and students coming from uh, Istituto Bruno Leone or this webinar uh, would be treated kindly uh, in, in, in enrolling in that, in that course. Uh, and I think it's a very important occasion, it's a very good chance uh, to go back to the basics uh, of something uh, so um, controversial, or in a way that should be more controversial in a sense, uh, like uh, monetary policy these days. I mean, uh, we tend to assume that the sort of situation we've been living through for the last, uh, uh, you know, 15 years is basically normal and there's nothing controversial about it. Uh, and instead, I think, you know, going back to the basic will help us also in better assessing uh, so-called non-conventional uh, monetary policies. Uh, but also uh, this seminar is quite relevant for us at Istituto Bruno because as some of our attendees know, uh, we've been working for, uh, well, quite a few years now uh, on an Italian translation of Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, um, Monetary History of the United States. Uh, this translation has been Uh, very complicated to pursue. It's a very complex, a very big book. Uh, but now eventually the book is being published and will be available in Italian, hopefully by the end of April, uh, with a new introduction that was written specifically for the Italian edition by John Taylor, a friend of ours and a very good monetary economist. Um, so uh, in a sense, I mean, I think it's, it's extremely 
good for us to have this occasion of, of this, to discuss on the principles of monetary policy with um, uh, our uh, extremely uh, authoritative and thoughtful guests. And I'm very grateful to Juan for this uh, opportunity to have this uh, event, this seminar uh, together. And uh, without further ado, I will uh, leave him the floor. Thank you so much again, Juan, for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alberto, for your very kind invitation and for, for, for hosting this, this event. I'm indeed in very good company with Antonio Foglia and Jeffrey Wood. And uh, Ter by yourself, uh, I'm pretty sure there will be a, a, a very interesting uh, discussion later on. I will try to stick to no more than 15, 20 minutes in my presentation. Uh, so then we can have a meaningful discussion uh, 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 among the, the members of the panel and with your audience, if you like. So if you don't mind, um, again, in order to discipline myself, uh, I'm going to share the screen. I will try to stick to uh, to, to the 20 minutes uh, presentation that uh, you suggested. So what is monetarism uh, good for? That's going to occupy the first part of the presentation. And the second is going to be an application of monetarism, or particularly the quantity theory of money, to explain the current inflation episode in Western, in most uh, Western economies. Let me start with the state of the question. These are some quotes that I took from very, very relevant policymakers in this field. The first one is from uh, no less than uh, uh, Jay Powell, the chairman of the US Federal Reserve in February, 2021. Uh, he said that the growth of M2, indeed monetary aggregate in the US, the growth of M2 doesn't really have important implications for the economic outlook. There you go. Another one, the link between money and inflation ended about 40 years ago by Jay Powell as well. Uh, the situation in the Eurozone is no better so here we have uh, the review of the ECB strategy last year. This is a synthesis published by the ECB. The monitor analysis has shifted from its main role of detecting risks to price stability over the medium term to long, longer term horizons towards a stronger emphasis on providing information for assessing monetary policy transmission. And here you have the, the summary message uh, of what this means. This shift in focus reflects a weakening of the empirical link between monetary aggregates and inflation. Again, this is the official uh, position of the, of the ECB. And in the case of the Bank of England, I could have added many other quotes, but if you check any of the monetary policy committee meetings by the Bank of England, there is a section, a specific section devoted to monetary and financial conditions. And in this section, you will not find the word money or monetary aggregates even mentioned. So the state of the question is really poor. <laughs> uh, central banks don't seem to be, to be paying much attention, if any at all, to the evolution of money and uh, the impact it, uh, it may have on, on inflation. This is something that uh, 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 Charles Hohart from the LSE, he has put very uh, nicely, I would say, uh, recently. Uh, in, in his opinion, there is no a coherent theory of inflation uh, used by central bankers but rather a sort of a bits and pieces approach to inflation. So uh, sometimes inflation will be explained by what's going on with uh, energy prices, commodity prices, the output cap, uh, wages, and so on. But there is a lack in a coherent explanation of inflation aside uh, for, of course, the, the quantity theory of money. So in this scenario, uh, more than, well, actually two years ago now, uh, a colleague of mine from the Institute, the chairman of the Institute of International Monetary Research, Tim Condon and myself, we ask ourselves this question. Does it matter uh, that money uh, grows at 25% per annum in the US at the time, in the spring 2020? Does it have any relevance for the economy? Or is, is, it, just, is it just neutral and we shouldn't really bother? So that's um, the, the question that we put to ourselves and we wrote a, a policy paper for the IEA, the Institute of Economic Affairs, that is available online. Uh, it's Inflation, the Next Threat, and it was published again in the spring 2020. What we warned at the time in the spring 2020 is that the increase in the amount of money, the surge in the amount of money in the US, but also in other, in other economies, was going to be inflationary. Well, what was the consensus back in 2020 and 2021? Well, if you check the statements, the policy statements, the official statements by, by the central banks at the time, uh, the forecast by the, the, the major, uh, the main uh, uh, institutions like uh, international organizations like the IMF or the World Bank and so on, 
uh, the COVID-19 crisis was, uh, uh, was expected to be uh, disinflationary or even deflationary over the medium term. Not just a question of a couple of months, but over the medium term. Then when prices, some prices started to increase, uh, like commodity prices or production prices later in 2021, uh, the, the, the central bankers, they changed the, the message and they insisted on, yes, there is a spike in inflation, but it's going to be transitory, whatever that meant, uh, by the way. And then finally, in 2022, uh, they have to, to come to, to realize that it wasn't, uh, it, was, it wasn't meant to be just a transitory phenomenon, but something much more permanent. Why this uh, failure in anticipating inflation? Well, in the models they use, in the consensus or mainstream models they use, money growth plays no part in explaining inflation. The so-called new case models, monetary aggregates are not in the, in the, in the equations of explaining inflation, basically. And another reason they, they used at the time in 2020 is that QE, quantitative easing, the monetary expansion uh, undertaken by central banks back in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, was not inflationary at the time. So why should it be now? Well, why should it be? Is because this time, if I may say, has been different. Here you have the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve Bank in the US, that's the shady area, and the, the, the solid line is the rate of growth of the CPI, inflation, consumer price inflation in the US. As you can tell, in the midst and in the aftermath of the global financial crisis years, indeed you have a surge in the, in the size of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, that's the monetary base, and you don't actually have inflation, actually disinflation, and even deflation for a couple of months. But the problem with this um, analysis is that we are explaining inflation as a function of a very narrow definition of money, which is the monetary base. When we use a broader definition of money, which is M3 in the US, which includes not just the money issued by the central bank cash in circulation, but also bank deposits, not only uh, uh, side deposits, uh, saving uh, deposits and alike, then the situation is different. The broader definition of money, changes in the broader definition of money are represented here by the dotted line that indeed declined in 2008, 9 and 10, and even uh, entered uh, the negative territory for, for a couple of terms. Mm -hmm. And that's what explains uh, the, the fall in prices at the time. So if we learned a lesson uh, in the global financial crisis is that if we want to explain uh, uh, changes in inflation, we need to pay attention to a broad definition of money and not a narrow definition of money. So what um, monetarism does, uh, and the quantity theory of money in particular, is to focus on the relation between changes in the amount of money and in prices, but in the medium to long term. So this is how uh, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, the author you referred to in your uh, introduction, refer, uh, uh, how he put it, uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it is and can be produced only by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. Mm -hmm. So which are the, the elements uh, in this um, quantity theory of money in the, the quantity equation, as it's called? Well, M is the quantity, uh, quant uh, the quantity of money, but broadly defined, including bank deposits. V is money velocity or the inverse of the, of the demand for money, the number of times uh, a currency unit is, uh, unit is uh, changes hands, if you like. P is the price level. Ideally, it will be the overall price level in the economy, but usually we we'll use the CPI as a proxy, consumer price index as a proxy. And T is for total transactions in the economy. Again, the broader the aggregate, the better, but usually we use uh, the GDP. Mm -hmm. So following this um, equation, whatever happens on the left-hand side of the equation is going to have a, a translation on the right-hand side of the equation. So in normal times, and may I stress this uh, as much as I can, in no crisis times, uh, money velocity is fairly stable and we can sort of uh, predict the trend growth of output in the economy. So if there is an excess in money growth on the left-hand side of the equation, that would be followed eventually by an increase in, in inflation in normal times, as I said. We can put this equation in terms of uh, rates of change. So by M here, we have the rate of growth of money, plus the rate of growth of money velocity equals inflation plus the rate of growth in the, in the economy. So which are the most common uh, criticism and even misconceptions about the quantity of money? 
One is that it only works when the money velocity is fixed. I will get back uh, to you on this in a minute. The other one is that uh, the monetary aggregate that we should be using in explaining inflation is a narrow definition of money, like the monetary base. And the other one is that uh, for, the, for the quantity theory of money to be validated, the effects of changes in money on prices should be automatic or instantaneous. Well, I do believe that these three are wrong, and I will explain myself in a minute. Starting with uh, money velocity, here you have on the left-hand side of the, of the slide, top left corner, changes in money velocity in the US uh, in quite a, a long-term perspective. So we say 100 years uh, uh, data display here. So as you can tell, up to 1960s, it was quite volatile. Uh, afterwards, it has been much more, much more stable. But anyway, uh, this series has a property that is called uh, stationarity, which means uh, uh, um, the series reverts to the, to, the, to the average, to the mean eventually. So periods of an increase in money velocity, such as these ones, for example, will or should be followed by periods of a decrease in money velocity. So overall, in, on average, we return to an average of uh, minus 1% per year. So if we are here, as we were in the spring uh, 2020, at, at the end of 2020, and we observed this massive decline in money velocity, according to the properties of the series, we could anticipate the recovery of money velocity eventually. Now that's something that effectively started to happen in 2021. Hmm? That's a very important condition in the series. So, and here on the right-hand side of the, of, the, of the slide, sorry, you have um, uh, nominal GDP. That's the right-hand side of the quantity, quantity equation. That's the blue line. And broad money, that's the orange line. So indeed there are differences, but you can tell that uh, the trends are roughly the same over time. We are using here 100, uh, 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 100 years data for the US economy. If we pay attention to more attention to just the last uh, few years, uh, here you have nominal GDP, again, the blue line, broad money, orange, and money velocity is the, is the green line. Let's just concentrate on what happened in 2020 and 2021. So indeed, with COVID-19 crisis, there was a, a huge fall in money velocity. People demanded much more money than, than ever, actually, in, 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 in recent times. So there was a huge uh, decline in money velocity. There was a run for liquidity, for precautionary reasons, if you like. At the same time, uh, central banks uh, reacted by uh, uh, implementing very expansionary monetary policies. So you have a huge increase in, in monetary growth in America. And for the most part of 2020, a very uh, profound uh, decline in nominal GDP. But once uh, the economy, the lockdown rules were relaxed and the economy went back to something more normal, uh, people returned to their pre-crisis or started to return to their pre-crisis levels of spending. That's why you, we see a recovery in money velocity. And with that recovery, we had a, a, a similar recovery in nominal GDP. So indeed, for a time, for a few months, the spring, summer, and the autumn of 2020, you have the, the, um, the combination of two uh, phenomena. One, a massive increase in monetary growth that, that was not inflationary because of the decrease in money velocity. But that amount of money, that huge uh, amount of money created in 2020, did not evaporate suddenly. And when people were able to spend the money again, they started to do so. That's why we have a, this um, very rapid acceleration in nominal spending and eventual inflation. This is another way to put it. This is um, some data collected by the Institute. With, with the same variables. So the, the yellow line corresponds to the average rate of growth of money, broad money, and the blue line is the average rate of growth of nominal GDP in different economies. So on the left-hand side of the chart, you have countries like Japan, Germany before the launch of the Euro, France, the US, and the Eurozone, with very moderate rates of growth of uh, money and equally moderate rates of growth of nominal GDP. And on the other extreme, the right-hand side of the chart, you have Turkey, Mexico, Russia, China, and Indonesia with much larger rates of growth of money and also much larger rates of growth of nominal GDP, which is here a proxy uh, uh, to, for, for inflation. Mm -hmm. But indeed, this process, uh, the effects of um, 
monetary policies in, in inflation uh, are not automatic, they take time. So first say that, that there is a certain amount of money in the economy, there is an excess in money balances in uh, people's and companies' uh, portfolios. So only in the very short term, you can tell that the, the, there might be, there would be most likely an increase in financial asset prices and in other uh, real assets that can take a question of hours, days, or even uh, weeks. Uh, once companies' uh, balances are much stronger, people's uh, balances are much more stronger, eventually there will be an increase in nominal spending, but that can take two to three quarters. And finally, the, the, the effects of this increase in spending on, on CPI prices may take one to two years. So for the quantity theory of money to operate, we don't need to impose that those uh, effects of monetary policies are automatic, because actually they aren't. And this is the evidence uh, we have uh, collected, well, that it has been collected for, for the US economy, and it can be translated to some extent uh, to other, other economies as well. So let me just uh, summarize um, so far what monetarism uh, uh, is, if I may say, and how we can use it for policy purposes. Um, we can use it to assess how inflationary or deflationary the monetary policy of a central bank uh, has been in the following way. So here, here all I did is to factor in uh, the, the, the values, the, the empirical values for the, the variables, including the quantity theory of money for the US economy. So say that uh, the trend rate of growth, real growth uh, for the US economy is something around two, 2.5%. Inflation targets of the Federal Reserve is uh, something around uh, 2% as well. And money velocity declines uh, at around minus 1% uh, per year. That will give you uh, uh, a rate of growth of money compatible with this economy, something around 4 and 5%, roughly speaking. Well, that's what is compatible with price stability. And as I said before, in 2020, uh, money grew in the US at 25% at some point, and above 10% for the majority of, for all 2021. And it's still at 10% now. What this is telling you is that indeed, um, the US uh, was going to have a, a, an inflationary pro, uh, problem. Uh, money was growing two, three, four, five times higher than the, the, what is considered as the standard, the benchmark to maintain price stability. And it's still growing uh, twice as high as, as it used to, as it should be in order to maintain price stability. This is something that I couldn't resist to add to my presentation. It's a very famous caricature by James uh, Gilray of the then prime minister, well, at the time, uh, William Peter Janga. Uh, here, uh, James Gilray is depicting the ability, uh, the, uh, the ability of the state to create money under the gold standard. At that time, there was a restriction, of course, uh, to create money, but now that restriction has disappeared. Central banks can create as much uh, money as they wish. Uh, potentially, theoretically, there is no limitation on the ability uh, uh, of the Bank of England or any other bank to create money. So what monetarism does is to provide a rule to constrain the ability of the state, be it the government or the central bank, uh, to create money. And it's now more than necessary than, than ever. So these are the topics we cover in the course you mentioned in your uh, introduction very kindly. And what we do is to explain precisely why this uh, huge increase in uh, money growth in the US could not be considered uh, neutral at the time, I should not be considered uh, neutral. This is something that we uh, discuss very much in the, in the course and provide explanations for it. Uh, the course is structured in um, five uh, lectures, video lectures, is fully taught online. There are a couple of tutorials with members of the IMR staff as well. And it should be completed in around four or six weeks. We can be flexible, but the, the benchmark is uh, six weeks. There is a case study per lecture, video interviews with uh, experts in the, in the field. Professor Wood is one of them. And at the end of the course, uh, the students are, they, they, they need to submit a, a 2.5,000 words uh, essay in order to, to pass the course and to receive their certificate. And indeed, we'll be very happy to apply a reduced uh, fee uh, for those coming from the Institute of, Institute of Bruno Leone. So if you're interested in the course, please visit our, our website. Uh, no surprise here, the, the, the website uh, is the quantity theory of money, mvpt.org. 
and then look for, for the online course. And be very happy to take your questions afterwards if you like. So thank you for your patience uh, to my uh, the rest of the panelists and to, to the chair of the session. I'm more than happy to pass it on to, to yourselves. Thank you, thank you very much, Juan. And, and your presentation actually already stimulated one question uh, that you can find in the chat uh, in the Q&A. Uh, I think we will go back to, um, to that very interesting point, which is raised by Alberto Ruiz uh, Hojeda. Um, now I'm very happy um, to ask uh, to Antonio Foglia to get in and you know perhaps uh, challenge you know some part of, of this account. Uh, I, I do remember we had plenty of conversation uh, with Antonio about the status of inflation in the last few years and, and particularly uh, how uh, how it moved or actually how it didn't, um, regardless of some uh, prediction uh, shared by <clears throat> people of the monetarist persuasion, if we may say so. Please, Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you for your kind uh, words before. Uh, I, I, I've been wondering for, for a while why on earth uh, uh, at this webinar we have two competent uh, academics and uh, you invited an incompetent market practitioner. And uh, I finally figured out that probably Professor Wood uh, wanted me invited to vindicate himself of the awful lunch I offered him in Milan in 2018. And uh, Alberto probably wanted me to promote the course so that uh, uh, none of the people who will follow the course will have to suffer the debacle that I will when uh, Professor Wood will respond to my remarks. As, as a market practitioner, I have used uh, monetarism with uh, mixed uh, success. Uh, and I can remember basically uh, four occasions. Uh, I lost money in two occasions. I lost money in Japan in the mid nineties uh, when uh, the amount of money creation that was there seemed to me to be incompatible with interest rate remaining at 2% and I shorted JGBs uh, uh, until I ran out of money. And uh, uh, also after the global financial crisis, when again, the monetary response was, was massive. And uh, I, as many market practitioner, uh, expected a, a classical uh, um, monetary response and hence, uh, uh, a spike in inflation uh, with a spike in interest rate and uh, we both called and lost and shorted bond and, and lost as well. In two occasions though, I made money with uh, um, monetarism and that was uh, in, in Switzerland in the late 80s, early 90s, when uh, uh, the central bank uh, changed uh, basically reserve and liquidity requirement from the banks and miscalculated entirely the amount of reserves they were releasing in the system. And since uh, at the time I was co-running a bank, uh, I, I could see the, that effect on my own balance sheet uh, and, uh, and could extrapolate it to the system and see that this would have uh, caused interest rate to fall to zero, inflation to explode and the CIS franc to weaken. Uh, in a classic monetary response, which is exactly what happened then. And I also am making money so far this year on monetarism by shorting US bonds, uh, seeing that <coughs> money growth uh, continues, to, um, uh, uh, continues to be uh, extremely large. So what are the uh, factor thinkering of these episodes that uh, determine the, the outcome. And I think uh, it is the fact that in the quantity theory of money uh, that uh, Pro uh, Dr. Castaneda uh, showed us, uh, in, uh, in, in monetary tend to assume that uh, uh, velocity of money as a variable is actually relatively stable. And uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, what we have seen is that it is not. And uh, I will come back to this. I think that using broader measure of money is a bit of a cheat, but for reason we will, we will see. 
And if I look at the episode, what actually happened both in Japan and in the global crisis was that there was a large fall in the velocity of, uh, of money. Uh, in the case of the Swiss episode, there was no change because a few in the economy realized that there was this monetary policy mistake. So uh, it, there was no impact on, on velocity. Uh, while in the current episode in the US, clearly, as we have seen, there is a pickup in velocity. What is this uh, velocity? Well, I think that the, to me, the best interpretation of velocity is uh, a bit like the mood of the animal spirits uh, and the general level of confidence uh, in, uh, in the system. Uh, if you look back at slide 15, where we showed the degree of growth uh, in, uh, in money and in nominal uh, uh, GDP, uh, from left to right, you have countries with, that have historical different level of confidence in their own system. You have, uh, you had at, at the far left, Japan, where people are extremely confident, never lose confidence in their system, and, and hence uh, um, there, there was no hyperinflation despite the massive uh, uh, printing of, of money. And on the other extreme, you have Russia, uh, where obviously uh, confidence uh, in, in, in their system is relatively low. But this is also visible uh, in terms of confidence or mood of uh, animal spirit in what happened uh, in Japan in the 90s. Uh, it, it was in a depression. Uh, animal spirits there were depressed. As they were depressed uh, after the global financial uh, crisis. And uh, uh, and the reason why we are now seeing uh, monetary theories working in the UK is that uh, um, uh, indeed, uh, as we were coming out of uh, uh, the COVID episode, confidence was being restored and uh, animal spirits uh, were back in the mood of uh, doing something with the money they were giving. And, and that is why um, that excess money in the system is being translated into um, uh, higher prices. Why I think that uh, using a broader measure of money uh, is a bit of a cheat is because uh, a broad measure of money uh, basically includes uh, uh, credit into the money. Uh, and, uh, and the creation of credit is very much a function of the mood of the animal spirits. So when we see that uh, uh, M3 um, <clears throat> actually fell in the US and hence uh, velocity remained uh, stable in episode that the GDP was actually going down, what that actually is telling us is that uh, at that time, uh, banks were not, lending, were not lending, but also the economy was not asking for loans. Uh, and, and hence using this broader measure of money, basically takes D already into uh, the, the, the definition of money uh, and, and that's a bit of a cheat. So from my point of view as a practitioner, the aspect that we need to focus on is actually uh, the, the velocity of money, what are the determinants of the velocity of money? And, uh, and, and uh, I think I can stop here and get ready to be slammed by Professor Wood. Well, uh, Jeffrey, uh, you've been called to duty. So it's up to you. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, it's a pleasure. And it's always a pleasure <coughs> to um, see Antonio Folia again, as well as the others. Um, he mentioned the terrible lunch we had in Milan. Well, I can tell him if he ever comes to Buckingham, he'll have a very much worse lunch there, I assure you. Um, I enjoyed his company. The pleasure of the company greatly outweighed the uh, quality of the lunch. Um, and let me now turn to his and uh, Juan's comments. Juan directed our attention to some things that central bankers and former central, former central bankers, such as Charles Goodhart said. And I think Charles Goodhart's comment on central bankers not having a theory of inflation can be, I think, neatly summarized by something else Charles said which was that recently central bankers are saying the cause of inflation is rising prices. 
That is exactly exemplified by our governor, our present governor of the bank, Andrew Bailey, who points to all sorts of things, none of which he can control as the cause of inflation. And that is simply pointless. Um, I think, however, that one perhaps went too far in the opposite direction, not in what he said, but in the focus of his remarks, because he focused on what we might call technical monetarism, the relationship between money and prices, and nothing but the relationship between money and prices. And Antonio Folia quite correctly pointed us in a slightly different direction, or perhaps along a broader road in the same direction. Because we should never forget that the quantity theory of money is actually a very old theory. And developed when the subject of economics did not exist. It was called something entirely different in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was called political economy. Indeed, it was called that more recently than the 17th and 18th centuries. My first degree from Aberdeen University, a very old university, is a degree in political economy. Now, what is the difference? Political economy, properly regarded, pays attention to institutions, to political structures, to how people's expectations are influenced by the set of institutions and, and the political structures in which they're based. And these are not treated as exogenous, but as people developing according to what seems suitable for the environment in which they're placed. So institutions matter and history matters in interpreting these data. And when we say that, when we see that, we observe immediately that the institutions and the history have affected how velocity has behaved. As, as, as Antonio Folio pointed out, it affected how velocity behaved according to what people expected of institutions. If there was a high trust, then, of course, money's holdings stayed fairly stable relative to income. If there was low trust, on the other hand, people got out of it the moment they saw some, uh, govern, governments and central banks interfering with money. And his historical experience, wherever they look, has showed, shown them that, that is exactly the right thing to do. And that leads to the technical part, we may call it, that of, of this historical analysis. <clears throat> the technical part takes us to what economists and political economists like to call the government budget constraint. Governments can raise money by taxes, by borrowing, or by printing money. Printing money is what they do when they can't do anything else. And that is what governments around the world have been doing recently. And printing money undermines confidence in that money because it tells people that the institutions have changed and no longer can be relied on to control that expense spending. They're simply printing money because they can, the bill for them will come in later. Accordingly then, <coughs> excuse me, accordingly then, we have to bear in mind that um, institutions and history matter as well as simply the technicalities. And when we say that, we can indeed interpret the relationship between, relationship between money and income are rather more clearly. You can, if you like, say we're interpreting it with hindsight, except that we're not. We're specifying from hindsight the factors that matter in the present. And when we have specified these factors, how trustworthy your government is, for example, then we can make a reasonable predictions, testable, falsifying the predictions about the present. So the first point I would make is that monetarism is rather broader than the technical issues, which one completely and correctly described. It leads us in additional directions, including trustworthiness and the nature of the society in which the money is produced. <clears throat> we can go on from that, I think, to various slightly more technical matters. For example, in recent years, Central bankers' responses to declines in the economy, to slowdowns in economic activity, including slowdowns they fear, but have not yet actually seen, is to expand the money supply. That is to make what really is a basic but very common error in economics. The economy output reflects what's going on in markets, and markets reflect the interaction of supply and demand. If you see output going down, it can be due to a drop in demand or to a drop in supply. Central bankers can do nothing whatsoever about drops in supply, except make the situation worse. If they confuse the two, they expand money growth regardless of why output has fallen. And this, of course, leads to destabilizing episodes and destabilizing expansions. In its masterly history of the Federal Reserve System, 
1908, a very fine economist, Professor Alan Knotzer, pointed out to at least two episodes in the history of the Fed when the kind of behaviour the Fed engaged in destabilises the economy because they stimulated the economy when output slowed, although in fact output was slowing due to a supply shock. I mention these because, of course, that is exactly what the Fed and the Bank of England and the ECB have done recently. They have simply pumped in money with the thought the money was slowing, the economy was slowing down, regardless of why it was slowing. As to why the models don't tell them that money matters, the models have really become very peculiar. Modern monetary, macroeconomic models anchor inflationary expectations somehow, somehow will come to it in a moment. And then the models always turn out to predict where inflation is anchored. Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England, one who understood economics in contrast to certain others. Um, Mervyn King recently published a paper through the Institute for International Monetary Research, in which he showed how these modern models had inflation turning out at exactly what the bank said it was going to turn out at. And this is why whatever the bank did in simulations of these models, they always got the desired inflation. He plainly had found this at the time unsatisfactory and found it even more unsatisfactory now. It essentially views individuals in society as passive consumers of money. If you increase the money supply, they will hoard it so, because they simply believe what the central bank is saying. If you reduce the money supply, again, they will spend it without having a squeeze on the inflation because they believe the inflation forecast for, for all for the central bank. Now, do people behave that way? Well, only, they only behave in that way in a society who, there are passive consumers of what the government and the central bank is doing. And I know of no society where that's the case so long if the central bank and the government persist in making major mistakes. So the central bank must have models which tell them that money doesn't matter, doesn't matter. These models tell them that money doesn't matter because they assume that individuals are stupid. Perhaps one should say more stupid than them, but whichever it is, they rely on stupidity of individuals. And individuals we know are rational, not in the strict sense of having formal rational expectations, but gathering information from the world around them and thinking what it means. Alan Meltzer, let me come back to him in conclusion. Alan Meltzer used to work a great deal with a German economist called, or Swiss economist, German Swiss economist called. Or. They coined the term rational, economizing, maximizing now by which they meant that inflation was information was costly. You had to gather this information by observation of other means. And then once you had gathered the information, you made the best use of it you could by understanding the situa situation you were in now and thinking about the situation <clears throat> that you were going to get into. Accordingly, then, if individuals behave that way, they watch central banks, they watch governments, they watch what the neighbors are doing. And this helps them to think rationally and economizing Economizing as best they can, not wasting resources, not gathering all information, gathering information until the marginal gain of gathering it is just equal to the marginal cost of doing so, as was enunciated in a classic paper which, with which I'm sure both Antonio Foley and Alberto Mangardi are very familiar, The Economics of Information by George Stigler in 1961, I think this was published. So we have, if we have individuals behaving that way, then we should expect on trend money growth to track inflation, but it also tells us about the behavior of governments and it tells us about how individuals trust governments. Therefore, monetarism can be simply technical and it's very useful, but it also gives us a much wider perspective on the workings of the economy. It's very useful in many ways and in the course one advertised, I have to confess we're going to touch it on some of these subjects. So come now, you will enjoy it. Alberto, over to you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And thank you very much also for um, highlighting and somehow pushing us into uh, considering the uh, political economy dimension of all this, uh, this matter, emphasizing that point. Uh, my proposal is that we now proceed in reverse order. So I'd like to ask Antonio if he has uh, some other comment and then go back uh, to one uh, also for the, the question we got uh, in the Q&A. I, I thank you, Alberto. I, I also appreciated the reference to political economy, the fact that institutions are endogenous. And uh, uh, I can think of um, uh, two uh, examples um, uh, on, on 
the matter of hand here. Um, the first is that um, uh, when we consider central bank and, and the causes of inflation, uh, actually uh, central bank have a, an enormous influence on uh, the velocity of money if we uh, take that as being uh, a measure of uh, uh, the confidence of animal spirits. Uh, uh, this was vividly true um, after the global financial crisis uh, when uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, seeing uh, extraordinary uh, monetary and policy response were actually more concerned by the response than by uh, a, a, a temporary recession due to a banking crisis. And that was probably the, why we had a, a more prolonged uh, crisis that uh, we should have. The second respect uh, by which uh, um, I, I see um, some uh, reflexivity in, uh, in the way central banks are, are handling uh, inflation today is that indeed they are uh, 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 looking at inflation expectation and, and, and trying to keep them anchored and so on. But in their looking at inflation expectation, they, they tend to use um, the market indication of inflation expectation, which we now have um, since uh, uh, basically the late 90s, uh, uh, certain governments like the US and, and some European ones have been issuing uh, inflation link bonds. Actually, they existed in the UK well be, before that. And by looking at what the break-even inflation is in those bonds, you can get a market measure uh, of uh, uh, what the market thinks of the inflation in the next three, five, uh, ten years uh, is. The problem with that, uh, the way it has been used in the, uh, since we have QE, is that the market for these inflation-linked bonds is actually quite narrow, way narrower than the market for nominal bonds. So uh, the, the, the fact that central banks were actually buying into those inflation-linked markets more in percentage-wise uh, pro rata than they were in the nominal uh, market meant that they depressed uh, real rates and uh, uh, they depressed uh, uh, the break-even inflation. Um, and uh, uh, so they were looking at a measure of inflation which was directly influenced by their own action in the market through QE. So uh, creating source of, of ambitious uh, uh, circularity in, in their reasoning and in their models. Thanks, Antonio. One. Thank you, Alberto. Um, yeah, very well, excellent comments uh, by, by Antonio and, and Jeffrey. I could agree more with Jeffrey. I'm sorry that I just have to stick to the, to the topics much more related to the cause we're advertising here today, but of course, Jeffrey couldn't be more right. And if anything, I have learned from uh, my writings with him and Professor Forrest Capney that institutions do matter and history. Uh, we need to, to, to study history in order to understand what's going on now. Uh, at least in monetary economics, I would extend it to any other aspect in social sciences. But indeed, I take your, your criticism and you couldn't be more right, uh, Jeffrey. And as regards um, uh, Antonio's comments, just to concentrate on a couple of them, Antonio, I, I may have to miss uh, some of them, I'm really sorry. But um, you just mentioned that um, in your first uh, 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 intervention that uh, um, in, the global, in the global finance uh, uh, crisis years, uh, monetary policies were expansionary, and yet inflation uh, didn't happen. Well, that's precisely uh, one of the one of the things that I wanted to discuss in my presentation that I that I addressed in my presentation. Yes, indeed, the balance sheets of the central banks did expand, but that did not correlate, did not uh, was not followed by uh, an increase in the amount of money in the economy. That's why it was not inflationary. Uh, many. There are several reasons to, to explain this. In the case of the US, as, as you will know, uh, the Federal Reserve changed the interest on reserves uh, policy. So it was much more profitable, actually, much more safe indeed, and also profitable for commercial banks um, uh, in, the, in the US to keep their money in the National Central Bank, in the Federal Reserve. So you see an increase in, um, in expansion in monetary policies, an increase in the amount of money created by the central bank not followed by an increase in lending or deposits, but just the reserves 
the, the banking sector kept at the National Central Bank. And that's not the actual money used in the economy to, to make transactions. That's why I made a distinction between narrow money, which is that money, cash in circulation and reserves, that is very much affected by institutions, as Jeffrey put it, changes in policies. Uh, and that's, that money does not, does not include, uh, explain uh, uh, spending patterns, basically. That's why I suggested that we used uh, a much broader definition of money, including not just cash in circulation, which is a tiny uh, proportion of the amount of money we use in our transactions, but bank deposits is money that we can mobilize uh, electronically uh, with a transfer or by using a debit card, effectively ordering our bank to mobilize our money from our current account into somebody else's. And that's the majority of the of the of the means of payments we use in our transactions, 80, 90 percent or even more in modern economies. So why using such a narrow definition of money to explain inflation? That's something that I wouldn't do, really. And it, precisely the experience of the global financial crisis years, uh, uh, well, actually shows us that uh, we shouldn't use a narrow definition of money. Again, it's exposed to changes in, in regulation, policies, etc. Another reason why the increase, the expansion in monetary policies in the global financial crisis did not translate into a higher amount of money in the market is because, as you know, there was a change in regulation, international regulation, bank regulation, uh, forcing banks to become safer. So it was the tightening of capital ratios, bank capital ratios, that forced banks to actually shrink their balance sheets. So you have the combination of changes in regulation policies, explaining why you can have uh, an increase in, uh, in, in expansionary policies by the uh, Federal Central Bank in that case, but not an increase in the amount of money in the economy. The money multiplier, as is explained in textbooks, uh, actually didn't, didn't work. That's why I would focus again on a broader definition of money, if, 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 if it makes sense. And, and that's it, really. I think it's best if we, we leave it for, for the audience to ask questions. Well, we do have two uh, very, um... Uh, complicated uh, and, and interesting uh, questions from the audience. I don't know if you can see them uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so one is from Alberto Ruiz Ojeda and the other one is from Matteo uh, Perini. So one is about, uh, as he writes, an apocalyptic uh, scenario uh, and the other one is about biases. Uh, in the academic debate over, uh, over central banking and, and inflation. Um, when do you want to uh, yeah. go first? Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding uh, uh, Alberto Ruiz Ojeda, uh, actually, he's a colleague of ours. We we know him very well. Thank you for for the comment for the question. Um, well, I don't, I can't answer to the second part of the question. Uh, uh, if money is going to die, in major monetary jurisdictions. I, I really, I really don't know. Uh, but he's asking if uh, whether I think or we think that. Uh, uh, we are experiencing a sort of a money bubble. Well, we did in the last uh, couple of years. If we compare the, the, the actual rate of growth of money with that benchmark that I put forward before, that compatible with price stability, indeed, there was too much money in the market. If that's what uh, Alberto refers to as a monetary bubble, yes, indeed, that monetary bubble ended up in uh, higher asset prices and also CPI prices, and I would... Uh, I agree with him on that. Uh, the second question is about um, the credit debate on inflation is affected by biases and how we should properly understand these biases. Um, it's a bit vague. I don't really know what, uh, what he means uh, with these uh, biases. If he refers to different models used to interpret the data and to make policy decisions, indeed, uh, he's right. Uh, one of the biases that we are suffering from at the minute so the current macro models used to make uh, policy decisions do not include all these variables we have been discussing uh, today. Well, I actually wonder if Matteo is not referring also to cognitive biases, uh, so uh, confirmation biases, uh, overconfidence uh, biases, and you know we we know that. Uh, somehow our our brain tricks us uh, in a whole bunch of. Uh, of areas, and I think his question may be actually, uh, but he may confirm that or not, uh, how 
uh, somehow monetary policy may be particularly uh, prone to some to be interpreted or misinterpreted uh, due to some particular uh, biases. Uh, I suppose you know you may reframe the question asking: Is there a psychological reason why the Phillips curve is still popular? I don't know if my no. colleagues want to to go ahead. Can I have a shot at that? I won't have a shot at that immediately. Um, is my microphone switched on, by the way? Don't yes, it is. I can hear you. Yes. Um, I'll, Antonio Folia mentioned that um, central bankers were targeting a measure of inflation expectations that they were, they were themselves fixing by dealing in the markets. But the situation is actually worse than that, certainly in Britain. Many years ago, there was a pension fund scandal when a man called Robert Maxwell stole a large part of the pension fund of the company he was a managing director chairman of at the time. The government of the day decided that this had to be stopped. Now, of course, it could have been stopped that anyone spotted what he was doing at the time, but they decided to bring in regulations which were nothing to do with this man's illegal actions, but to make pension funds hold more government bonds, because as we all know, government bonds are completely safe. They could still have been stolen, but pension funds have to hold more and more of them as the fund grows. And thus, of course, they are now exposed to great big losses as interest rates rise. And at the same time, not only are they exposed to big losses, but the rate on these index linked bonds which they're buying is fixed. So it's another way in which the market is being rigged by governments and central banks. And that's one of the cognitive biases they have. They always like to see numbers that confirm what they're doing is right and give them opportunities for taking more money from the taxpayer. Um, turning to broad versus narrow money, one actually missed out one of the most dramatic episodes of all in this regard and how the demand for narrow money can fluctuate because narrow money has a property that broad money does not. If we think back to the Great Depression, and we should be able to do that, because Alberto mentioned his introduction at an Italian translation of Morton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's great book, A Monetary History of the United States, is about to appear. In that book, chapter seven, if I recollect, it's called The Great Contraction. They showed how in that episode, there was a major economic collapse because the demand for narrow money was continually rising, rising more rapidly than the Federal Reserve was, was supplying it. It was rising because banks were failing. Narrow money was safe from bank failures, because narrow money we can think of in the simple sense as, if you like, banknotes. This was safe. People were hoarding more and more of them. So the broad money supply was collapsing at the same time as the narrow money supply was rising, because what was going on in the economy fundamentally affected demand. That is why most of the time, narrow money and broad money may tell you the same story, but at times of economic stress, broad money is more informative because it responds to what individuals are thinking and doing. Now, um, finally, will money disappear? Well, it sounds like a, techno a simple technocratic question about monetary theory, but in fact, it's not. It's a question about the economics of information. Because money is a device for trans transferring information, transfer knowledge of prices. It's, part, it's an intrinsic part of the price system. Imagine that we lived in a barter economy. How could prices be conveyed? It would be immensely difficult to get prices disclosed to everybody at the same time, or more or less at the same time, because you have to be continually walking around the market, checking the price of oranges rather than the price, to the price of lemons, and so on and so forth. All this information is summarized by what used to be called the measuring rod of money. It's a very convenient use to what useful device. And this, the need for this useful device will never disappear. Can it be replaced by computers? Or well, it can't, because unless there's a market outside the computer, the prices will not be disclosed. Accordingly then, money in the sense of conveying information will always be there. It may not be exactly the same form as we have now, a bank note produced by the European Central Bank, by the Bank of England, by the Fed, but money in that important sense will still exist and it will matter for the economy. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. One, you raised your hand. Yes, yes, Alberto, thank you. Uh, going back to this question by Matteo uh, on the TAT uh, section, um, I do believe that um, 
there is um, there is a bias, uh, for example, uh, in the members of the monetary policy committees of uh, major central banks, it's a selection bias, I, say, I think. Most of them think the same way. <laughs> uh, and that's a problem, especially in the crisis time, as Jeffrey just put it, uh, you want someone to question the, the, the mainstream, if you like, uh, because otherwise everyone is going to make perhaps an optimal de decision following the, the, the mainstream models uh, at the time, but a profoundly wrong optimal decision. <laughs> so uh, that's something that I, I just wanted to mention, that sometimes the, the way in which the members of the monetary policy committees are selected is not ideal because they follow the same patterns, the same models, the same thinking. Yes, group think is always dangerous. Antonio. Yes, uh, um, uh, a couple of comments. One on uh, uh, the second part of Matteo's question, uh, whether the CPI is, uh, is reliable or, or, or not. Um, the, when, when there was the uh, transition from the lira to the euro, there were lots of discussion about whether CPI was capturing uh, inflation in the right way and so on. But all the empirical studies that I have seen, uh, and also uh, basically based on the uh, changes in demand for from of certain goods that might have been ex, um, influenced by a change in price, like uh, for instance cinema tickets and stuff like that. Uh, showed that there was uh, no cheating about it. And in my own research as a financial practitioner, I was actually surprised of how well uh, basically CPI uh, captures inflation of, uh, between different uh, countries. I mean, even countries like uh, um, a Latin American one in Brazil or, or in Argentina that have experienced uh, hyperinflation, if you actually look at a series of their exchange rate versus the dollar and CPI differential between the, the official CPI in those countries and that in the US, the, the two track themselves precisely well, even through hyperinflation, which means that even country that would have every incentive to cheat on the CPI, uh, like current countries that are experiencing uh, high or hyperinflation actually don't do uh, don't do it. Of course, CPI has a narrow definition. It's just a basket of uh, goods that consumer use. It does not include the, the prices of assets and other stuff. Uh, but as a measure of um, uh, buying a power of a currency, it is actually extremely uh, uh, reliable. Thank you, Antonio. We do have another question from Massimo Scagliotti now in the Q&A, perhaps uh, one want to answer to that. Yes, if you so me for a second, uh, Massimo, yeah. He's asking for how much is the percentage of money that could be available, could be available to increase inflation? Uh, I think okay. one, your calculation for the US deals with that. Yeah, I, I was going to share oh. this, this. Do you mind if I share this screen again, Jeffrey Alberto? Go ahead. Yeah, it's um, the one. one. Yeah, it's the one with the um, calculation of the, let's say that a benchmark for money growth compatible with price stability, I believe it's here. Yeah, this is the one. So um, again, this is uh, these values reflect the, the behavior of a particular economy, the, the US economy. So. All I'm doing here, all I did is to solve the equation for M and then factor in which are the, the, the expected values for all these other variables. So if the GDP is growing in the, in the US at around 2, 2.5%, this is 2.5 here. The inflation target of the Federal Reserve would be 2% here and V uh, would be minus 1%. So if we solve the equation for M, that will give you a, a range for the rate of growth of growth money compatible with price stability around 4.5%. Anything above that, in principle, if it continues as a trend, uh, will eventually be inflationary. And my point is that both in 2020 massively, 2021, but also now, still now, 
the amount, uh, the rate of growth of money in the US is still at 10% roughly. Uh, so it's still twice as much as it should be. Thank you, Juan. I, I, can I add to, add to this uh, um, in, in the sense that this allowed me to go back to um, Dr. Castaneda comment before about uh, what happened with the reserves at the Fed of the American banking system after the global financial crisis. What he says is absolutely right. Uh, but we also talk uh, in that times about excess, massive excess reserves kept uh, at the central bank. And that actually means reserves that were way beyond uh, the reserves uh, that were increased uh, by the new regulation coming in after the crisis that did force banks to keep more liquidity at the central bank. And those excess reserves were basically due to uh, a, a low velocity, the fact that animal spirit weren't willing to borrow, banks weren't willing to lend. So since money was put into the system, where did it end up? It ended up at the, back at the central bank, which is uh, quite normal, but it was at least as I experienced it in the market, it was basically due to a collapse in, uh, in the mood of animal spirit that you can measure either as a, as a fall in V on a narrow measure of money, or uh, as the fact that uh, M3 does not increase as much as it should, uh, given the increase in, uh, in M1. Can I just come in on that briefly and say, I think the term excess reserves is actually very damaging and misleading because it implies that there are reserves you don't want to hold. You have too much of it. The reserves are voluntarily held not optimally held, but voluntary, because there's nothing better and safer to do. You actually choose to do it, and they reflect rational, cautious behavior of banks and of individuals. Uh, absolutely, they were totally voluntary, mm. uh, but just because they didn't have anything better to do with it, as you say. Yes. And that was due to a collapse in, uh, in, in, in velocity, in confidence. And due to a collapse in confidence and the collapse in velocity is simply a consequence of the collapse in confidence. Confidence is something people have or do not have. Velocity is a consequence of this thing that people have or do not have. Sure. But uh, Jeffrey, Antonio, this may apply. I'm pretty sure that it did apply to the first few months uh, uh, in the midst of the global financial crisis. Indeed, there was a crisis of uh, confidence, if you like. A huge uncertainty in the market. So why risking the money if you can put it in your national central bank at a decent or higher than a market uh, uh, interest rate? But my point is that this change in regulation uh, uh, provoked a, a, a change in the behavior of banks persistently years after the global financial crisis. If you observe the, 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 the data on excess reserves uh, by the uh, commercial banking sector in the US, this persistence with this uh, interest rates on reserves uh, policy by the uh, Federal Reserve and the changes in capital regulation changed the dynamics, uh, the ways in which uh, banks operated. And uh, it, it resulted in an excess in money just deposited in the National Central Bank. You can compare this policy to that of other uh, 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 banks in other jurisdictions, such as the, the UK and in particular the Eurozone, in which the policy has been completely, well, not completely different, but rather different. The European, the European Central Bank, they do charge uh, a negative interest rates for the deposits put by the national central banks in the, in the ECB. Well, but actually, I, I look at it at exactly the same in the sense that the reason why the Swiss uh, Central Bank or the ECB are charging negative rates uh, is actually to try to force the bank not to leave the liquidity at the central bank, but actually do something with it and, and lend it. So yeah. again, it is we, we have a, a fall in confidence, which causes a fall in velocity, uh, and central bank are trying to push back by enforcing negative rates, uh, thinking that uh, banks may find better things to do uh, than keeping excess reserves at the central bank at negative rates. But Antonio, and I mean, we have, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Forcing negative rates undermines confidence. Of Is course, I, I agree. I mean, it's part of those excessive uh, uh, policies 
yes. uh, that, uh, uh, that that undermine confidence. I mean, sure. when people see excessive fiscal uh, uh, policy or excessive monetary policy, uh, they 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 have a rational expectation about it, mm. <laughs> and, and hence become uh, uh, less willing to to invest, take risk, and so on and so forth. So in that respect, there is a big value in in monitoring because in the, in, in in essence, while uh, policies like uh, um, uh, Keynesian policies are intrinsically entirely irresponsible, because when uh, John Minor Keynes tells you that in the long run we are all dead, but just means that he's not willing to contemplate the long-term consequences of the reckless policies that he's suggesting. Uh, monitoring is, on the other side is based on sounder values uh, that basically push back the responsibility on the actors uh, and, and hence are sounder for the longer term. Of course, this explains the relative unpopularity of monetarism these days. Uh, Juan, you wanted to add something? Uh, something very brief. We have collected um, uh, data on uh, sectoral money balances, the demand for money by different sectors in the economy in the last, uh, in the last few years, indeed including the COVID-19 uh, crisis years, uh, for the UK, for the Eurozone and for the US. And in all cases, of course, we, we see a surge in the demand for money by the three sectors in 2020 until the end of 2020. And then the demand for money has uh, returned towards, it's moving towards pre-crisis levels since then, since early to 2021. All I'm trying to say is, indeed, there are changes in money velocity, <clears throat> changes in the demand for money. They are explained by animal spirits, as Antonio put it, changes in confidence uh, in institutions, uncertainty about the economy. But that is not, according to the data at least, that is not a permanent future. Eventually, agents will return to something close to the pre-crisis levels. And whenever that happens, the amount of money created in the meantime uh, will, will be manifested in inflation. That's precisely what I think uh, one of the major policy consequences of uh, the adoption of the quantity of money. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Juan. We do have, uh, you know, there's a chance for asking uh, other questions or for comments if anybody in the audience uh, has one. You know, if you are on Zoom, you may also um, uh, speak up, I think so. Uh, am I right, uh, Veronica? Of course they are. Um, I'm going to switch to Italian for instructions. Um, per porre una domanda a voce potete utilizzare il tasto alza la mano che trovate nella barra in basso dei comandi. If uh, we're not getting any question, um, let me just ask you, you know, when we talk about monetarism, uh, one of the, so to say, institutional consequences of, of the relative success of monetarism um, was the very idea of an independent central bank. How is that idea doing these days? How is central bank independence? Oh, delegates on the authority it's, here it's, on the panel. It's, it's, an, it's an idea. It, it, it was never a reality. Central banks are nominated by politicians and uh, are, are there to ensure that uh, the politician that would uh, reconfirm them is going to be re-elected. So uh, it, it never really, uh, it, it was a good idea in principle, but uh, cannot really work in, in practice. Jeffrey? You should remember that central banks, the world's first two central banks, others followed them, the, bank, the Riks Bank and the Bank of England were founded and given special privileges to help governments raise money. So they were, they were never independent in that sense. But we also need to think about what independence actually means. And the term was invented, as I'm sure Alberto knows, by, in a paper by Milton Friedman, when he was discussing various forms of entrenching price stability. It can, our central bank independence was an idea that had been advanced. He argued that if the central bankers were going to be independent, what were they going to be independent over? They had to have a clear and enforceable mandate. He suggested inflation targeting. He explained very clearly why that would be unsatisfactory. 
and thus came down to concluding in favour of targeting a monetary aggregate. Central bank independence has been misled and is really a fiction, a convenient fiction. After all, it was imported in New Zealand and it was a great success there. But what this tells us is that a bad tool, I mean, a not very good tool, I should say, a not very good tool can be very useful if you're in very bad circumstances. In New Zealand, monetary policy and economic policy generally had been blatantly politicised. This was a way of restricting order, politicisation, and also giving a roughly observable constraint, guidance to the central bank, just as government ministries were also being given constraints and guidance on how to manage their funds and how to achieve what they were supposed to achieve. So it never existed in the sense which people treat it nowadays. It was invented for a rather different purpose and you could never really serve anything wider than that. Thank you. If we don't... Well, one, one further point on central bank independence. Mm -hmm. It does seem to work and help to deliver price stability in society where levels of trust are high and where politicians don't interfere with well-working institutions. It's a very small set of institutions in countries indeed. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and perhaps it's not really, I mean, it's, the, 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 the group is not growing in size lately. Um, I, uh, before uh, uh, closing and, you know, uh, releasing you and, and, and thanking you very much for this wonderful discussion, um, I'd like to ask to one if he has uh, another pitch uh, for uh, the course. So, you know, if you, if you, if you would like to say uh, some more words on, on that. Uh, yes, I mean, the course, I mean, you can find now, uh, you can see it on the screen, uh, uh, the page uh, on the course on the Institute's uh, website. There you can find information about the, the topics. Um, it's very much an introduction to, to monetarism. Uh, and it's done, um, through the, the, the publication of, um, of uh, video interviews and video lectures as well, and some case studies uh, related to the topics covered in the lecture. So uh, hopefully you will find it useful, not just as a, as a theoretical investigation, but indeed as something you can apply to understand what's going on, especially since March 2020. Uh, we follow um, the, 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 the quantity theory of money in order to explain the expected effects at the time of the expansionary monetary policies adopted by major central banks. And we do believe that it will give you a successful explanation of such effects in recent months. So we very much welcome applications from those affiliated or friends of the uh, Instituto Bruno Leone. And we are very happy to obviously to, to apply a reduced fee to those coming from, from yourselves. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to, to Juan Castaneda. Uh, well, thank you very much. To Jeffrey Wood, to Antonio Foglia, thank you for to the Institute of International Monetary Research at Buckingham University uh, for this opportunity. It's um, clearly it's it's not uh, it's not the easiest uh, subject for a webinar discussion, uh, but in these days and with fear of inflation and a very heated uh, debate even on on the newspaper and, and in the media. I think it was a wonderful occasion uh, somehow to uh, clarify uh, some thoughts. And, and, and I'm sure that for those uh, in our audience that will uh, participate in the uh, IIMR course, you know, that there will be another wonderful uh, opportunity to uh, get, a, get a grasp uh, on, this, on this very complex and fascinating uh, issue. So thank you so much to Juan, thank you so much for, to Antonio, thank you so much uh, to Jeffrey. It was wonderful to see you all and thanks for this discussion. Thank you Alberto for having us. Thank you very much. It was instructive and enjoyable. I did enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed.